Well, uh, thank you, uh, Les. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, I want to begin by saying that, um, uh, by paying tribute to the work of the Northern Ireland Commission, um, there are many national human rights institutions in countries around the world. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting some uh, real, I don't know what the negative term is, but uh, <laughs> some real losers, um, where uh, basically they see their role as uh, trumpeting how good the government is, or else they are simply much too timid to really say anything useful. Um, so it's a particular pleasure to see uh, and of course the other side of it is that there are in uh, many countries actually very um, effective and very productive uh, commissions. I've just come from in fact Poland uh, which had a National Human Rights Congress, 1600 people in attendance, uh, organized by the National Human Rights Institution. Uh, basically the only body that's really standing up effectively for human rights in the face of the onslaught against the rule of law. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, uh, this commission really is actually very special. Uh, partly, of course, the whole Good Friday background, partly the fact that human rights occupy a place here in Northern Ireland which is very hard to challenge in many other countries, we have a lot of uh, people saying we're in a post-human rights era or human rights don't do it for us, etc. Uh, Northern Ireland has had the experiences, has come through them and knows that uh, a genuine commitment to a shared set of values is the only real option for moving forward. Uh, and I hugely admire the work that uh, Les and all of his colleagues uh, do here. Uh, I want to um, look at a couple of things today. One is to um, reflect a little bit on the report that I presented on uh, poverty and human rights in the UK uh, earlier this year to the UN. Um, and I also want to pick up on two other issues. One which Les mentioned, which is the relevance of new technologies in these areas. Uh, and the other is climate change and how that relates to uh, to what um, we're all doing in the human rights area. Um, it is obviously a pretty dramatic moment uh, here in Northern Ireland. The revival of the talks is uh, potentially splendid news and is going to put back on the political agenda a whole range of much neglected, uh, uh, many neglected issues. Uh, nationally, we've got the dramatic change in the political landscape uh, in Westminster, and that too is going to bring, I think, uh, very major changes. I'd like to reflect a bit on those. And of course, internationally, um, I am, uh, unfortunately, and I think it's not just because I'm an Australian, which, as you may know, is burning brightly um, these days, thanks to climate change. Um, but uh, I think the failure of the negotiations in Madrid um, this week um, is a momentous failure, uh, which unfortunately is being treated as, well, it's another international negotiation, never mind, there'll be another one next year. Um, and I want to argue that it's actually much more dramatic than that. Um, the question, the big question for me is where does poverty fit into all of this because obviously my role is to try to bring these two issues together which in Northern Ireland I think that happens fairly naturally in a way because people are here aware that if you are living in poverty your access to so many rights is very severely constrained. Uh, it's a great relief of course to be out of the United States uh, where I live um, at least temporarily, because there the debate immediately begins, but there is no such thing as social rights. Uh, and therefore, as long as we have civil rights and people are not being beaten up on the streets, all is well. But of course, the poverty and human rights perspective goes much beyond that, that if you're not able to live a decent life, 
if you're not able to access all of the things that one needs for living meaningfully, uh, then you are not just in poverty, but you are not able to enjoy uh, all of your rights. It is those who are in poverty who are most affected by human rights violations, uh, which again is something that many of the human rights groups don't pay a lot of attention to. It doesn't matter what the issue is, you take violence against women, you take torture, you can take anything. And the bottom line is that poor people are affected very differently and much more dramatically. They have no defences, uh, they have no one to stand up for them, uh, they're easy targets. Um, and so where there are these violations, it's the poor who really suffer much more. Um, the report that I presented, uh, very briefly, I uh, presume that uh, most of you have some uh, awareness that uh, it happened. Um, I was here in my capacity as UN Special Rapporteur, which is simply a fancy title for independent expert advising the UN Human Rights Council. Um, I had full cooperation from the government. I travelled around uh, all parts of the UK uh, and I came up with a preliminary report in November of last year and then a final report in June of this year. Um, I'm sure you know the statistics. I think we unfortunately mostly go to sleep when we hear too many statistics, but um, it's worth repeating some of them. One-fifth of the UK population live in poverty, 14 million people. One and a half million of those experienced destitution last year. Destitution, as low as you can possibly get. Well over, as Les said, one-third of all children uh, living in poverty and the rates are getting worse. Uh, we know about the proliferation of food banks, homelessness, rough sleeping, um, a whole range of other issues. I think what my report did, apart from just recounting those statistics, was to make the case that the social safety net in the UK has been, uh, I fear, irrevocably damaged. Uh, the great legacy coming out of the Beverage Commission and the other post-war initiatives, um, it's going to be very hard uh, to replace uh, that overall package. Yes, the NHS was an important part of Beverage, and yes, it looks as though it's not uh, at r risk these days, um, but the NHS is only one part of a broader social safety net and many other parts really have been uh, fundamentally undermined. Um, the other, I think, controversial part of the report that I made was my claim that austerity, which is this um, mythical beast or whatever, um, is not, in fact, uh, a notion that comes out of economic necessity, but is rather an opportunity to pursue a particular ideological agenda. Um, that's controversial. I'm delighted to address it in question time, uh, but I feel very strongly that that is the case. Uh, and I think that those who designed austerity back in 2010 should actually feel very proud of themselves. They've transformed the UK. Uh, they've changed attitudes. Uh, they've comprehensively undermined notions of solidarity. Uh, they have elevated the distinctions between the deserving and undeserving poor. Uh, they have pursued a determination that those who are poorly off are also on their own and are not going to get assistance. And I think that was always part of the agenda and austerity has done very well to uh, achieve it. <clears throat> I want to reflect very briefly on uh, the, uh, the relevance or the impact of my report. Um, 
that it has to be said that uh, reports of special rapporteurs are well capable of sinking without trace uh, almost instantly. Um, I think I could provide a couple of examples from my own experience where reports that I have written have had no significant impact whatsoever on the relevant governments. Um, that didn't happen in this case. Uh, if we look at media coverage, which is only one small part of the overall picture, um, there were some uh, 3,000, I think probably it's closer to 4,000 now separate media pieces uh, written about the report. Uh, and that is uh, huge by any standards, all of the major newspapers. Uh, I was very grateful to The Times, uh, for example, for devoting an entire editorial to why I should be dismissed, uh, <laughs> or maybe educated first and then dismissed. Um, so media was terrific. Uh, civil society engagement uh, was extraordinary. Uh, I met with a number of the people in this room, in fact, when I was here. Um, but throughout uh, the UK, uh, civil society really came together in a way that was extraordinarily impressive um, and contributed. And I'll talk more about that uh, in just a moment. Um, but after the report came out, some 40 organisations uh, separately published responses to the findings. Uh, there were references by religious leaders, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, uh, a whole range of others, the British Medical Journal, the Lancet and others uh, picked up on the report and I think that's good. That's what this, these sorts of analyses should do. As I <coughs> had occasion to say a number of times, I have no authority, no power at all. Uh, the report is only as good as the impact that it has. If it resonates domestically, it must have been a good report. Uh, if it doesn't, it was almost certainly a bad report. So getting this sort of uptake and response is very reassuring. Then there's the official side of it. Uh, Parliament was um, uh, interesting uh, to watch, I suppose, is the right term. <coughs> um, I uh, had uh, an initial outreach from the office of the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions suggesting that she might like to speak with me, uh, but she was then immediately asked in Parliament uh, on the day after I left basically what she thought of the report and then had to say that having read it over the weekend she was horrified and it was terrible and uh, so on. Uh, that didn't get us off to a very good start. Uh, it was then sort of amusing. Um, I don't think anyone else would have noticed this, but um, the late Jeremy Corbyn um, <laughs> actually opened question time, I think uh, about three days in a row, uh, with a question about my report. Uh, what is the Prime Minister going to do in response to the Special Rapporteur's report? Um, you can imagine that uh, the Prime Minister uh, basically said that all was well in the world, that my report didn't uh, add anything and uh, nothing needed to be done. Um, but there were, I think, very rewarding hearings in the Parliament. Uh, I mentioned to Les last night that uh, I would personally lament the fact that Frank Field was defeated in this election because Frank Field, who is a famous maverick uh, in uh, UK politics, was nonetheless an extraordinarily effective chair of the key parliamentary committee uh, who really, I think, kept uh, the feet of the uh, bureaucrats and others to the fire uh, in this area. Uh, I hope that the new parliament will be able to be as engaged uh, and as effective on some of these issues. Uh, in terms of the other devolved governments, the Scottish cabinet actually sent me a formal letter endorsing my findings. 
there was there were parliamentary hearings in both Scotland and Wales, um, and uh, the Welsh Assembly also adopted a formal statement uh, endorsing my key findings. Um, politically, it was interesting. Um, it ranged from uh, Amber Rudd making a range of comments. On the one hand, this is all political, this is inflammatory, uh, down to, but we will certainly take the report seriously. Uh, I think a high point was Philip Hammond. Uh, I reject the idea that there are vast numbers of people facing dire poverty in this country. I don't accept the UN Rapporteur's report at all. I think it's a nonsense. Look around you. That's not what we see in this country. I'm not sure where Mr. Hammond was looking, but uh, obviously not in the right places. Um, however, I think that the report did, before it was really overwhelmed by Brexit, actually start to have some impact. And what I observed was that Amber Rudd, when she was there, started to announce a number of what I'd call important tweaks uh, to the overall system, which I welcomed. Uh, they were, of course, always, and this, but this is normal, uh, prefaced by the observation that, of course, this has nothing to do with that stupid report by the stupid special rapporteur. Uh, these are just things that I now think we need to do. But that's the way these things happen, and I found it quite gratifying uh, that there was actually some movement. Um, finally, uh, the official government response um, was um, rather disappointing in a way. They sent, a, I think it was 10 pages or whatever, of comments um, in a very boring UN document which got no publicity, etc. Uh, we regret the inflammatory language and overtly political tone of this report. And we strongly refute the claim that the design and delivery of welfare reforms, including universal credit, are deliberately punitive, a, a claim that I didn't make. I did say that certain aspects of universal credit were implemented punitively, but not that the system is punitive. We see universal credit as a much needed and positive reform. So do I, en principe, but one has to see how it's actually put into practice. Tackling poverty will always be a priority for this government. That's probably true because they're making sure that poverty will always be around and so <laughs> therefore uh, we are undertaking the biggest welfare reform program for a generation. It is working. The employment rate is at a record high, etc, etc. Um, I think uh, the sad thing, as I said, is that Brexit then just pushed this uh, off the agenda. And uh, the real question then is, where do we go from here? And I'll make a couple of observations about that. First of all, just one um, broad reflection, I think, on the role of the report. The, the real paradox, in a way, uh, is that I said nothing new, um, nothing. I was drawing on the extraordinary reports done by hundreds of civil society organizations, think tanks, human rights commissions and others, uh, and bringing them together. But what's interesting about the exercise is that uh, the work of a UN expert has an added value uh, which is uh, not to be dismissed, I think. First of all, uh, there's a strict word limit to my report, which is actually a very good thing. It compels a bringing together of a large amount of information uh, in somewhat synthetic form. You saw the 
horrible size, I mean the um, large um, report that Les did last year, um, I'm sure there's a lot of very worthy stuff in there, uh, but the reality is that it's Les and me and a few others who read all of that um, and not uh, the average person. But a UN report which is really limited to 20 pages or whatever, uh, it's possible for a lot more to read it. It has some sort of UN imprimatur about it, although it's strange because the UN will consistently say, of course, this is not a UN report. It's just that expert. But that's not how it's seen by anyone outside. It is, in fact, a UN report. Um, I am, despite what uh, Amber Rudd or others might say, uh, acting neutrally in terms of my position uh, as between different political parties and so on. I'm not able to be pigeonholed. Well, he's a whatever and therefore don't take it seriously. Um, and I think overall the best uh, outcome was that my report actually drew a lot of attention to some of the terrific research that's been done out there and helped some of those organisations to get more of a profile for their work, uh, even though I had added very little. Um, where do we go from here? Um, I think uh, I'm really just a, an outside observer now, like you. My expectation would be that there will be pretty radical change in Westminster, uh, that the talk about uh, deep reorganization of the bureaucracy uh, is always a sign that um, very large transformations are likely to be bound up in all of that. I assume we will see a resumption of attacks on human rights, which were really only put on hold within the Conservative Party for Brexit purposes, but were otherwise uh, up and running. And Dominic Cummings has certainly uh, said a number of times that this is the next item on the agenda. Um, and then we have the budget limitations which weren't much talked about during the election, all of these different things on offer. But of course, uh, we wake up this morning to a report from the Office on Budget Responsibility saying, actually, guys, things are grim. Uh, the budget is getting way out of kilter. You're going to have to either raise taxes or cut back on your spending promises. Uh, so a lot of the expectations that there is more money that's going to be pumped into different things um, we will see, but I don't uh, think there's reason to be overly confident about that. Um, the Conservative Party manifesto, um, I would have to say on my reading of it, uh, that much of it is really directed at the uh, middle classes. Uh, so when we look at all the different social headings in terms of housing, in terms of childcare, uh, in terms of a range of other issues, they are not at all directed to those who are living in poverty. Uh, and universal credit is basically uh, remaining very much on target. Um, as I indicated earlier, the uh, comments that the Prime Minister made early in the campaign that austerity is definitively finished, we're going to roll it back and so on. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but that, first of all, won't happen. Uh, and secondly, it can't happen. Uh, because the impact of austerity for me has been on destroying key parts of the social fabric, particularly in England, more dramatically so, because uh, you in Northern Ireland and in Scotland have been able to mitigate. Uh, but in England, the destruction of local councils and all of the social functions they performed, the selling off of libraries, the closing down of youth centres, that's not going to be rolled back. Uh, and that can't be replaced in terms of the real fabric of the community. Uh, key challenges, um, if there really is an agenda to look after uh, universe, uh, to look after people who are living in poverty, uh, 
Um, the five-week uh, waiting time for universal credit is simply cruel and inhuman and utterly unjustifiable, despite the pretexts. Uh, the two-child cap, I agree with Les. Uh, I, I don't see this government rolling it back, but um, it's astonishing that it hasn't caused an uprising um, because it's just a classic, the poor should have no more children, but the rich can breed all they like. Um, disability uh, is one of the tragic dimensions that I saw during my time here. Um, it seemed to me that a lot of the uh, measures implemented under austerity and reform, etc., were again almost cruel in their total neglect of the particular impact on people with disabilities. Uh, and while the manifesto makes some statement about disability, uh, I think that the problems are deeper uh, than the sort of concessions that are likely to be made. Um, finally, and one issue on which the Irish uh, Human Rights and Equality Commission and the Northern Ireland Commission have done great work is the question of the impact of Brexit uh, on people. Uh, I have seen nothing from this government to uh, indicate that they are planning to try to um, soften the landing uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that uh, people who are not currently well off are as always going to be the main ones to suffer the negative consequences of the economic hit which is absolutely unavoidable uh, coming out of Brexit. Um, I don't have much to add on uh, Northern Ireland I have to say, uh, I think Les said it very effectively Obviously, the mitigation package is extremely important. I think the recognition of economic and social rights as rights is excellent. Um, the emphasis on a right to food and a right to housing uh, would be really important um, future directions. Um, and I want to just say a few words then about the issue that Les raised um, of the impact of new technologies uh, in the human rights area. But I want to go beyond the specific issues that he raised, which I see as the common uh, perception of a lot of human rights groups, but I think we need to go more broadly. One of the things that I did in my report on the UK was to look at what I called the digital welfare state uh, and the many ways in which uh, that has a particularly problematic impact on the poor. Uh, those of you who have seen uh, I, Daniel Blake, uh, Ken Loach's movie, uh, I remember saying to Esther McVeigh at the end of our discussion, what did you think of the movie? Ah, nonsense, it, it doesn't reflect the reality at all. Tragically, after my tour around the country, I think Ken Loach got it absolutely right. Uh, sadly. And an important part of that is the digital by default policy, for example, uh, which has huge negative consequences in a country uh, in which one in five people are not uh, digitally literate and less than half of those living on a low income um, have uh, broadband based internet at home. And so making all these things digital by default while closing all the public libraries which have computer uh, facilities and so on uh, is uh, a very serious uh, step. Um, one of the amusing things which uh, went uh, pretty much unnoticed, I think, in this country um, is that um, a gentleman by the name of B. Johnson addressed the UN General Assembly in September this year. And his entire speech was devoted to warning of the dangers of the digital age. The whole speech. The risk of round-the-clock surveillance, the perils of algorithmic decision-making, 
the difficulty of appealing against computer-generated determinations, the inability to plead extenuating, extenuating circumstances when the decision-maker is an algorithm. He concluded by suggesting that digital authoritarianism was an emerging reality and one warned of dire consequences if new technology doesn't reflect the rights contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's Boris Johnson. I don't know how he reconciles that with uh, universal credit and the way it's implemented. I suspect that what's going on is that this is um, a, a fear that, I mean, it's okay to treat the poor like this. The poor have always been treated like that. They've always been, there's always been efforts to control and surveil and whatever. But the risk is that if we really develop these technologies, at some stage they're going to be turned on people like us and Boris. Uh, and that is deeply problematic. But it would be very interesting to see if there's going to be any movement uh, to pick up on that warning by the Prime Minister and say, what are you going to do about it? Because certainly what I saw uh, in my meetings with the Department of Work and Pensions and others is a full-on move to transform government, quote, to digitise government, uh, and the development of all sorts of algorithms and programs and so on, which will match data from many different sources, which will enable far greater intrusiveness. But if you want to get the details of those programs, forget it. You can't. The department doesn't provide any meaningful details. And in any event, much of it is outsourced to private uh, actors uh, and they are protected by their commercial interests. They're not going to tell you how the result of the algorithm uh, is achieved. I want to <clears throat> end, I, I would have liked to go on longer, but I think it's more important to have questions to say that um, I see these problems um, that I identified in relation to what I call the digital welfare state emerging at the global level uh, in a very major way. One of the big trends, and I, I, I hugely admire what Les is doing, and I hope what you said about uh, the arrangement to limit access and limit the size of police databases and so on uh, is really going to be meaningful. I would have to be very pessimistic because what I see internationally is a huge push towards the development of what are called comprehensive uh, biometric identification systems uh, driven by a whole range of different factors. Sometimes it is what they call financial inclusion Sometimes it is we need for development purposes to be able to count everyone and give them an identity. Sometimes it's for security reasons. Uh, the police and the military can better track terrorists and criminals. And very often it's on the basis that people will be better off. They, more welfare will be able to be targeted towards them and so on. But these different systems are moving ahead at extraordinary speed in countries that you're probably, some countries that you probably never heard of and others that you were not aware of. So the United States, like the UK, has always resisted any sort of national ID card, but it's happening. Uh, all of the driver's license uh, databases are being combined. Uh, they all have biometrics in the sense that you've got uh, facial uh, you've got photographs which are then converted into facial recognition. Uh, fingerprints are collected comprehensively in the US. DNA databases are growing enormously. And the pressures to put all these together are immense. Uh, and I see that happening uh, on a global level. And what I see is human rights being completely absent. Uh, the big tech companies don't touch human rights. Um, many reasons for not doing that. Instead, 
ethics. Of course, you all know what ethics are, don't you? Well, if you do, you're ahead of me. Uh, because ethics is this vague, amorphous, it's, you know, your ethical values might be quite different from mine, uh, let alone from uh, Mark Zuckerberg's and uh, other people's. So you move away from human rights, which are defined, which are accepted, to ethics. And we will set up our own watchdog bodies, but we will not be applying human rights standards because those are passe. Um, final point, uh, just a very quick word on the issue of climate change. Um, I put out a report earlier this year, um, first of all saying that I think that anyone engaged in any aspect of human rights should be deeply engaged with climate change because whatever you're doing is going to be dramatically affected. Uh, the sort of development efforts that are being made around the world, the billions that we're pouring into development, uh, so many of the schemes that we're undertaking domestically, they're all going to be dramatically affected by climate change. Uh, we are only now starting to see the record high temperatures, uh, the change in precipitation, I was in Poland and people said, you know, it always snows in November and certainly in December the ground is completely covered. This year there hasn't been a single snowflake. Um, that's life. That's what's going to happen. That then has all sorts of flow-on effects in terms of the crops, uh, in terms of the jobs, uh, in terms of costs, uh, and everything else. And those of us concerned about economic and social rights, cannot afford to think that climate change is anything other than a huge game changer unless something can be done about it. I also think that in civil and political rights, it's even more dramatic. I think there are going to be challenges to democracy uh, because democracies are proving themselves very incapable of responding to this. I think the influx of uh, people from other countries that is going to happen. Climate migration in the tens and probably hundreds of millions will make Syria and Iraq look like, and Yemen look like a joke, uh, which you know, basically turned Europe upside down. Um, I think governments are going to be declaring states of climate emergency, which the UK has done, but that will be followed by states of human rights emergency uh, to stop the protests uh, it's happened in Australia, it's happened in the United States, bringing in huge penalties uh, for anyone who uh, interferes with infrastructure or tries to prevent certain you know, uh, environmental catastrophes from going ahead. Uh, those pressures are only, only going to grow. Um, and I think so far the human rights community has done very little. Uh, Mary Robinson, obviously a lone voice in the wilderness. Um, I almost feel embarrassed because I um, used to work pretty closely with Mary in different ways over the years. But I looked with some puzzlement, I suppose, in the early years back, what, 2002, 2003, when Mary kept saying, climate change, climate change. And none of us in the human rights area paid any real attention. It was just, isn't it nice that Mary's doing this? You know, I'm sure it's an important issue, but just like a hundred others. The reality is it ain't like a hundred others. It's really on its own. Uh, and I think that human rights groups have a deep responsibility to ask what they can do. You can't change climate change, clearly, but you can start changing policies. You can start contributing to the pressure on governments to make this a real priority issue. Um, I've spoken longer than I had intended to. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.